Hi, everyone. Welcome to the weekly politics show. Uh, myself, Councillor Kurumi, and co host, uh, Councillor Andrew Ridd. So, in, t in this segment, we're going to talk about Tower Hamlets Council's Inequality Commission and the report that's been put out by the Inequality Commission. So, the Inequality Commission was a commission that was set up on the back of uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so, um, the political leadership in the council wanted to do something about it, look at structural discrimination that residents face uh, in terms of how they interact with the council and other public services. They've published a report a few days ago and we're joined by a guest um, who's not going to give his true name because he's working and doesn't want to have consequences, uh, but someone who took part in the commission um, and it's uh, Abdul. Abdul, um, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Abdul, we can hear you. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, I know um, it, it is tough, so like, especially in the kind of job that you're involved in, so like speaking out. But um, Abdul, do you just do you just want to go through how you come across the Inequality Commission and how you felt when you saw that it was set up and what it was going to do, and your colleagues and other people that took part <coughs> in the commission uh, who gave evidence to it. Um, I came across it uh, probably late um, 2020, and I thought, oh, this is this is a quite a positive step for the council to sort of lead on and sort of look at what is happening within the borough, especially a diverse borough as ours. And uh, obviously, there's a visibly there's a clear difference between the power that uh, people that hold power position and obviously the people at the bottom who are the your general sweepers, cleaners, and so on. Um, I, th I was quite excited. Um, I spoke to my colleagues and friends. I thought, let's get involved um, because I w hopefully, w w if we put our voices forward, there'll be some change. And if I'm honest with you, probably it was a 50 50 split where people thought, um, do we really want to get involved? It's just going to be another report where um, it gets whitewashed or it sort of like um, just paints over the cracks, really, and then that's it. It, it, nothing gets done, um, but I, I managed to convince a few people, and we got on board, and we sort of <clears throat> gave our evidence in terms of our lived experiences, what it feels like to be in the borough. I've been in the borough for a very, very long time, uh, and I've seen the difference in from from the from education to physical activity to health and well-being, all of those things in terms of how it's how it's come across from. 80s to 90s and so on and uh, as I said to you I, I wanted to get involved because I was a victim of such uh, should I say <laughs> structures of racism I would probably strongly say there are institutional racism and these things happen covertly they don't happen overtly because obviously it, it, there'll be an outcry they happen covertly and they happen within the positions of power if you look at a lot of the positions in whatever industry you look at they were mostly held by white people. And people who are educated, qualified, like myself, qualified to do a professional job, um, highly influential job within the borough, we get overlooked. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, two examples, really. Um, one was um, I went for a job. The questions, and th these are all factual, by the way, and uh, I'm more than happy to contest it if need be. Questions for the interview was given to my counterpart. And obviously they got the job. And then um, you know, go, going for a position higher up, I was um, um, I was excluded from a, a higher position job because um, I, for, I don't know. Well, they say they didn't, I didn't have the right qualification, uh, right experience, even though I was the only one qualified for that position. So these are the types of racism we and myself and other colleagues brought to the table to the commission to say, look, look, there's, there's enough of us here saying the same thing. We need you to start looking at why it, this is happening, what can be done, and how we can challenge this, because at the end of the day, we need not just ourselves, but the future generation of the borough, and not just future generation of our borough, but borough, uh, people outside the borough, nationally and probably uh, regionally, to, to probably look at us and say, we're making a difference, we're making that change. And... If you look at the laws, Equality, I think, Act came in 2010. That's great. We're, we're, we're in 2020, and now we're doing a equality report. 
I think it should have been done probably two or three years into or two or three after the Equality Act came out, so that way we can start looking at ourselves and go forward. Um, but if, if I if I read the report or I've read the report and if I'm honest with you, it did highlight a few things I was hoping, like structural racism, um, obviously uh, racism within certain industries and so on, and also the impact it has on people, not just the young people, but also uh, the older generation in terms of how they're not being progressed into positions where they can make a, a decision which they understand better than probably other people do, especially people from, from white backgrounds. So if you're making a decision for brown people, you need that brown viewpoint. And at the moment, we don't really have that. And that's what's, what's, what's sort of lacking in this report. It doesn't go far enough. But what I'll say is, when you look at the recommendations, are they good enough? And having the discussion between the people who took part, they don't agree it, is, it goes far enough. First of, all, uh, first of all, there's no measurable outcomes that you want, m maybe in the first year or in the third year or the fifth year. What are they? What are the mechanisms to make sure th these, these are met, these targets are met? And thirdly, um, who's going to be accountable? Like yesterday, I saw the launch and I saw loads of social media posts about, oh, well done, everybody. Everybody sort of seemed to be high-fiving and congratulating each other. But what have we achieved? We, we're just highlighting the same issues we've had through the disparity report, through other reports that's come about. Um, even if you go back to the McPherson report back in 2000 and the review report back in 2008, change has happened but at a very slow rate. But we still get these um, barriers where people from my background and other background, BME background, are not getting those positions, are being overlooked. There's a big sense of cronyism. People are getting jobs because their friends are there or I know that person and that person is getting the job because that relationship we have with, with each other. And the quality um, of people who have come through the education system with degrees, experiences, wealth of, wealth of knowledge that they bring from their own community into the community is, is lost. And I'll give you uh, the, um, one of the quotes from the disparity report. 17.5 billion pounds is being lost from the economy because people of being, uh, being background have been completely ignored or overlooked and so on. And this is not me saying this. This is a report commissioned by Theresa May in 2017. So why did it take someone who died in America for us to be looking at ourselves, looking at what the, these, these things. Why wasn't this done a lot earlier? We have one of the biggest being counselor groups in the country, and still we are not de developing policies or implementing policies where um, the council itself, um, institution of education or, or um, the NHS, no one's been held accountable. So uh, what I would like to see, um, if I'm honest with you, going forward, I would like to take the, uh, I would like the commissioners and the commission lead to look at the action plan and come up with measurable outcomes or targets that can be reached. And if we can make it quick, fantastic. All right, it's, it's a win-win situation. But what we don't want, and uh, this is not just me saying this, this is a, our group which took part this to be a tick box exercise. And if I'm, if I'm honest with you, totally honest with you, the first initial um, response we've had is it does look like that because there are, there are the, the actions and accountability missing from this key document. And I hope, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, in three years' time, we, we, we don't look back and say, oh, it's just another report we put on the shelf and highlight the same issues we've done for the last 20 years. Okay, so j just to give the viewers an understanding, the sector that you work in is education. Is that is that correct? Yes, it is you don't have to be yeah. specific, uh, uh, and that's in Tower Hamlets. Yes, it is in Tower Hamlets. Yeah. And 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 the people who gave evidence with you worked in the education sector. Yes, they did. They, they, do you know what? It was it was a range of people from senior leadership team to people who were in middle middle level um, middle level experience. And if I, if I'm honest with you. The, the, the wealth of experience covered over, I think, 150 years, if we, if we all sort of put our um, years of experience together. And every single one of them believed that people with the right experience, the right knowledge, were being overlooked. And if I'm honest with you, if I compared myself to a, a white counterpart, that white counterpart every time was fast-tracking to those roles. Um, 
we we never understood why that was, but these are the things that we we sort of like accepted. But I'll tell you something. Uh, there's a lot of fear out in the community in terms of like if if we complain, if we make if we make um, a, a bit of noise about it, it's, it's our job on the line, and that's when people get victimized, um, bullied, and so on, and then the people end up leaving the profession. And this is the biggest fear. And I just I just don't think it's 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 it's, it's, it's it's sort of limited to our profession. There's other positions where you be- make a bit of noise. You're classed as a troublemaker. You're, you're, you're someone who's causing trouble. But all you want is equality where you get the same, the same privileges as a person of work background. And I'll give you an example. This has happened many times in, in my institution where people have been foul struck straight away because they fit into that mold of what they're looking for rather than thinking what is the right what is the right person for that role and who would have the biggest impact within that community so that's that, that's my point of view um a- andrew do you want to uh, uh, come into this before we go to a break um yes yeah, so actually i'll start with a question and i'll talk about the process later so i, I sit on uh, a number of appointment panels so basically councillors and the mayor are involved in sort of the the sort of um the process of basically picking sort of the, the next group of sort of leaders or sort of interview panels. So we have people applying for jobs at a senior level and I'm on the panel of people that review the CVs that we get and then basically then do do the interview at the end. And one of the things that's really struck me over the years, even though we are very keen to recruit people of BME origin, and in fact, the latest appointment panel I was on ended up uh, actually picking somebody uh, originally from Africa, uh, actually into an educational role. But one of the things that's really struck me over the years is how rare it is to get any existing Tower Hamlets Council or partner organisation employees applying for these jobs. I can think of only two occasions in seven years where I've sat an interview panel where there's been at least one person who's actually applied uh, for, for one of the senior jobs that's going. And, and do you have you know, an answer as, as to why so few people are applying or getting through? Or this, is it just this, people aren't applying because they don't feel confident in the process or they just don't feel encouraged to apply? Well, it's, it's, it's a mixture of um, various things, really, because I'll be honest with you. When I applied for a senior role, I was, I was thinking, I'm just going to apply and see what happens. And true to word, it, it happened. I was the only one excluded from the whole process, and I was the only person of color from the whole process. So these are the things that people see, and people think, what is the point? Why am I going to put myself through all that hassle and then be rejected? Because we know, like, we, I could tell you before the interview who was going to get the job, because that's how obvious it was. And within the education system, this is how obvious it is. When people get appointed, it's people who they know, it's people who they prep behind the scene. Like the whole process of interview and so on, it's all about transparency and showing that we are doing, going through the processes and do um, look, due diligence and all of that stuff. But what, what you don't know is what happens between, um, a bit behind the scenes. And there's a whole network of things that are happening. People are prepping themselves through people they know within the committee. I'm not, you, I'm not saying you do this, Andrew, but it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. There's networks of um, people behind the scenes on WhatsApp group. They, they sort of put, push people forward, and those are the people who get, end up getting the job. And um, people are not confident in applying because they've lost confidence in the system. Mm-hmm. And this is exactly why people don't put themselves forward. Otherwise, we have a whole pool of talent in this borough. If, if we have a big group of people in this borough, are you telling me that, that there's people in this borough who are not good enough? If we're good enough to be doctors, we're good enough to be uh, um, solicitors, or good enough to be a, a lead within um, the NHS system, then we're good enough to do anything else. But the problem is the system is currently not letting us down. And this is where the conscious bias, the structural um, racism comes in. And and this is at the highest level. And, and, and I'm hopefully one day I can speak about this more openly than I am now. This is what happens at the highest level. The decision makers are the ones who, most of the time that I've seen, pre-select the ones that they want for the job. And mm-hmm. we are just pawns in a system where we, 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 we're sort of like, oh, fantastic, we've got a couple of people who are from the BME. We, we show that we are showing, we are encouraging those people to, to, to sort of take part. And when you don't get the job, 
the classic example is, oh, you need a bit more experience. Oh, you need to get more, more qualified. What do you say to a person who's already qualified, who already got the um, experience for that job, but then is refused an interview? You can't really say anything. <laughs> so these are, these are the things that we, in, in my industry, have faced. And I know for a fact um, in the NHS it's happened the same because I'm in contact with someone who's a national lead for cardiology, and he's from the he's from a BAME background, and he's he said exactly the same thing. We we put ourselves forward unless we know those people, unless we we run in the same circles as those those people, we're never going to get a look in. We're just we're just someone who applies. Okay, fine, thank you for applying. Better luck next time. And that's it. Okay, so we're we're going to go to a break. After the break, I'll let Andrew come in with uh, another question to Abdul. So we're just going to go to a break. Break. <laughs> so we're back back. Welcome after the break. Uh, this is the Politics Show with myself, Councillor Premier, with co-host Councillor Andrew Wood. So we started off the show with speaking to Abdul, who took part in the uh, Inequality Commission set up by Tower Hamlets Council uh, on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and uh, Ab Ab Abdul, just that's his name that, is, that we're going to use in the programme because he works in Tower Hamlets in one of the, the education sector. And uh, so he's just... Um, doesn't want to jeopardize his job actually so um andrew um i cut you off um you abdul's answered the first question you mm -hmm. had another follow-up question to him yeah, so, so um i've been reading the report as well and i haven't finished yet but the, the first bit i went to was kind of the recommendations and there are there are a lot of them which i think is actually a, a fault in the report there's there's too many to track but what would your sort of main recommendations be either from what's already in that document or, or what do you think is missing from that document in terms of recommendations? I think well, one of the things that we need to um, sort of formalise is, first of all, as I said before, where's the data to back up some of this stuff? Like, where are we with the data? How many numbers of people who hold positions of authority, both in public sector or in the private sector? Um, from that, you, you have a base where you can look at targets that you can set, aspirational target and obviously realistic targets. It's no good saying, oh, we need to put more people in, in, in forms of training and education. That's great, but at the end of the day, um, what, if, what if you get one person who's, who's, who's come into the training program? Fine. But in terms of like going on to become a leader or becoming a role model within an industry where people can actually, well, these guys can make those decisions for the community that they come from, it's, it's missing. Then these are the gaps that need to be sort of um, put in. And also, who's, who's, how is this going to be accountable to anybody? At the moment, obviously, Asma is the commission lead. Um, she might not be in a position next year in terms of going forward, um, not being a councillor or, or being deputy mayor. Who's going to take that on? Who's going to be held accountable within the council is it going to be um will tuckley or is it going to be someone else we don't know that um and also the mechanism one of the biggest things that we have in a community like ours is fear fear to come out and speak freely and say i have been a victim 
and uh, because I've been a victim, I'm going to report it. There should be a reporting system where people can anonymous, anonymously say stuff and then it, there's action from it. And, and there's nothing in substance to say. I know we've got whistleblowing policy, but I don't think many people know about that, if I'm honest with you. There's going to be a handful of people who actually know about these whistleblowing policies that the council can actually take on and actually do something about it. So it needs, it needs a bit more thought in terms of um, how we how we sort of hold the report to account and also individual to account and I think uh, obviously I'm not uh, uh, my answers are not the exact answers. There's going to be other people that the council need to go back to, the commission need to go back to and say, all right, what can we do? How do we get you uh, an experienced person, a person of of responsibility in a position of authority to make decisions to benefit that community that you're standing in? So and also make visibility of these people more prominent within. The community because at the moment if there are many people who are in positions of authority we don't really see them much and as as Kamala Harris said many many months ago you can't be what you what you can't see and this is the problem we have cool now I think it's very interesting what you said about sort of targets because um, one of the things I like to do with council documents is to see how often some words appear or, or don't appear and it's very interesting, actually, the word target appears 48 times in the 54 pages, but I, I can't see any actual targets. It just says the word target without any actual targets, which means, therefore, it's very difficult to, to track the performance. And I, and I came back to what I was saying earlier about the appointments process. You know, it's not a terrible process because one of the things we're very keen on as counsellors is sometimes, you know, we'll see, see a CV of somebody who, who is a long shot, you know, who doesn't have the right experience but maybe has something interesting in their background that we want to try. And I remember a recent interview panel, there was, there was a really fantastic candidate. Unfortunately, he didn't have the right experience for that job, but, but the feedback to him was, you know, we want to see you in a job somewhere in, in Tower Hamlets. So it's interesting at our level, we are willing to take risks, but what's coming through the system is generally people who are, who are not from Tower Hamlets. And most of the, well, in fact, nearly every senior officer in Tower Hamlets Council is not from Tower Hamlets, um, which I, th I find mm. shocking. Um, I, I want to come in on this. So I actually, after reading the report, because I work in the civil service, I actually looked at what Whitehall has in place. And it's, it's a day-night difference in the sense that following the Equalities Act in 2010, Whitehall had policies in place in 2014 um, and one, so they actually, we, we actually got targets in, in the civil service where they actually break down the different grades of um, officers within and what is. Is the demographic uh, breakdown and there's targets set within the service. These grades need to be much more representative. Um, and and so they set these targets and then they have something called positive action groups that's underrepresentative who have protective characteristics so it could be gender it could be age it could be disability as well and what they do they set up training pathways to encourage um officers at a lower grade to go through these training pathways to apply for much more senior positions but um I haven't come across anything like that in Tower Hamlets Council, and that's set up in 2014 it, under, under a Conservative government. It, 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 so it's, it's a Conservative government, and even recently, um, we all had to do training, etc. All all the service had to do training in the uh, following on the back of uh, uh, the uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, and it was directed from the minister. You know, everybody has to do the training. We have to give feedback. And they, there was this target set at each level, kind of just like, what are we going to do to basically make the service much more represented? But I find those kind of discussions lacking in Tower Hamlet's council, which which is kind of surprise. It just seems like we're so behind the curve on this. We are. Um, and 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 it's not like it's it's actual legal obligations that we have. It's a one the public sector equality duty. One of them is that you have to basically tackle any underrepresentation of protective characteristics through your policies. And then positive action is actually in the Equalities Act under Section One Five Eight and One Five Nine, where they actually set out what it actually means, which is basically provide training and encouragement 
it's not you're not setting quotas you're not you still assess the applications on a merit-based system but what you're doing is you're 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 admitting as an employer that because of societal structures certain groups are disadvantaged so what you're going to do is you're going to try to mitigate those disadvantages so everybody has an equal shot at, at those jobs etc so they, there is a, and recently they said that we want a hundred or uh so like officers at a senior level from a bme background so they actually got a so like a a target that they're going to measure in and then they have senior officers who are in charge of each aspect of the target so we know which officer which di divisional director is in charge of that and the reporting structure as well and each of them have so like bullet point targets like phase what we're going to do this and and that so it's it's very well thought out like a proper plan but it seems nothing like that exists in tower hamlets or has has been produced off the back of that andrew do you want to come on those sort of like reflection yes i was going to ask sort of abdul a final question so, so the next stage of this it it goes to cabinet on wednesday and in cabinet will basically agree it and in the cabinet report it basically says in terms of what's happening next is comment on how the council can play a leadership role in taking forward the recommendations including changes in policy within the council so it's basically for cabinet to discuss on Wednesday how they take this forward. But but how do you think we should be continuing this process going forward as, as councillors and as residents of Tower Hamlets? I, th I think we need to have a wider discussion in, in terms of the outcomes of the uh, from the recommendations and put it out there to, to see, OK, are you happy with the recommendation? Because at the end of the day, the councillors can agree to this or disagree with this, but if it's not fit for purpose in terms of who it's going to be impacting, then it's, it's, it's a paper which is worthless, really. You might, might, might as well use it. So I think there needs to be further consultation in terms of from the recommendations were made. How can that be implemented? What do we need more to make sure that there is accountability in terms of meeting certain targets and, and people will feel that they can step up, they can do the training if they need to or get the experience they need to to become the next leader or become the next role model because at the end of the day, there's a whole generation behind us that need to see that change because when you look back from the, the racist times that our parents grew up in, in Brick Lane and so on, fighting all those changes, what has really changed? The only thing that's changed is gone behind closed doors. It's behind uh, the camera rather than in front of it. And this is what the cabinet needs to decide. Do we agree it because we, this is what we've come up with or do we agree in, in consultation with the people who took part or other people? And there needs to be a further, further consultation process that needs to happen. Um, and I, I agree with you what, what, what you say, Peru, about the, the stages within government and civil service that the, the, they, they put these things in place. When you reflect back on what you said, at each point there's accountability of numbers or people or the stage who's responsible for, or for, for delivering certain things. With this document, you couldn't clearly identify who's actually going to be delivering things, what policy is going to be coming in and how is it going to be implemented, monitored, evaluated and so on. Um, it's great if the council pass it, which is which is good. But the next stage is, is the difficult stuff in terms of how do we measure that success. And until we do that in consultation with the people of the community, then I don't think we're going to see any real outcome. It's just as I said, it's just going to be another document that we can put on the shelf to collect dust. Cool. Um, any any final thoughts, uh, Andrew? Any anything you want to say, or Abdul? Before before we go to a break, Abdul, do you want to say anything else before we go to a break? Any final? Um, just just uh, uh, look, thank you for um 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 having me on the show, uh, and I, I'm hope I'm I'm not just a lone voice. I hope um there's other voices who who hear my voice and think, do you know what? I I can really stand up. I can feel what Abdul is saying, and, and this is these are the uh, the barriers the the uh, closed doors that we're facing until we change and uh, uh, sorry one of the things I was going to mention the council plays a pivotal role in this they have the power to do so much but they haven't done so it's, it's been very little in terms of coming in as I go back to the number of Bangladeshi BAME councillors we have in the council this should have been done years ago because they they would have felt all of those changes it's become a 
uh, like a ceremonial position that these councillors are sitting in those positions and think, yeah, okay, we're, we're making decisions, but there's no point making decisions if they don't affect the people that need to be affected by these policies. And obviously equality is a massive thing. Uh, and I hope these councillors take responsibility and their duty very seriously when, when it comes to this document, uh, because it, it, it should be changing lives for the future, for, 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 for the next couple of years, but also for the generations coming behind us. Cool. Any final thoughts, Andrew, before we go to a break? Um, sorry, you're on mute, I think. Sorry, I got family yeah. stuff in the background. Sure. So, no, delivery is key. Like everything to do with the, with the council, we have to deliver on this stuff. Cool. So, um, let's let's see what happened. Let's see what the cabinet says on this. Um, but we're going to go to a break. Um, I just want to say thanks, Abdul, for coming. And we might ask Thank you to you come back me. if there's any further developments. But we're going to go to a break. After the break, we're going to discuss livable streets. Um, the calling that happened or didn't happen and what happens next so join us after the break thank you guys thank you, thank you.